Welcome to the fifth the annual Judith Nielsen Lecture, lecture as, part as part of the Utsun Lecture series. series. This, this lecture, lecture is titled Crises, Construction, Construction and Corruption. My, My name is David Sanderson, Sanderson from UNSW. From UNSW. Before, Before anything, anything else, else, I'd like to start with the acknowledgement of country that is customary in Australia. In Australia. I, would I would like, like to acknowledge the Gadigal and Bejigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional, traditional custodians of the land which the UNSW Kensington campus says. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and future, who hold the memories, traditions, culture and hopes of Indigenous Australia. I would also like to extend that acknowledgement to all Indigenous people with us today. Before we begin some uh, light housekeeping, this event is being recorded and will be made available afterwards. The audience questions and answers, the Q&A, will be conducted by the live chat function at the, at the top, top right, right corner, corner, if you're on a web, web browser. browser. If you're on a mobile, mobile device, device, that, that function, function is directly under the video. video. Please post, post your questions, questions throughout the session, session and they will, they will be posted, posted or passed on to us, I should say, during the Q&A, and, and we'll get to as many of those as we can afterwards. If audience members have any difficulty and cannot use that chat function, please email us at be.events at unsw.edu.au. And I'll just say that again. BE.events at UNSWEDUA, as you can see on the screen. So, about the lecture, we've had truly amazing speakers each year for this prestigious lecture over the last five years, and this year's speaker richly follows in that tradition. This lecture also marks the launch of our two day second Urban Resilience Asia Pacific Conference, Europe 2, which begins tomorrow at 9 a.m. That conference, that conference will build on many of the many themes of our speaker tonight. tonight. We'll, be we'll be talking about this evening. So please, so please visit, visit our website, eurap2.com, for details of how to join online, online and for free with a simple, simple one-click to YouTube. YouTube. So, so to our speaker, to our speaker it's, my it's my absolute, absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker, speaker Professor, Professor George Afori. Afori. Professor Afori specializes in construction management and improving construction practices, especially in low- and middle-income countries. For nearly four decades, he's been a consultant to a large number of international development agencies. George is the Deputy Chairman of the International Board of Costs, the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative. He is currently Dean of the School of the Built Environment and Architecture at London South Bank University in the UK. And more importantly, perhaps, at least for us, is that he's an alumnus of UNSW. So, welcome home, George. Tonight, George is going to talk about the complex weaving of crises, construction, and corruption. Disasters such as windstorms, floods, and earthquakes are not only natural. There's no such thing as a natural disaster. How we build, where we build, and what care we take to make buildings safe is down to us. And when corners are cut, lives get risked. After all, as the saying goes, it's the building collapsing that kills you, not the earthquake. After, After George's, George's talk, talk, as I said, we'll have time to Q&A, so please do post, post your questions, questions all the way through, through and, and, and we'll, we'll have a rich conversation, conversation talking, talking to George after, after we hear his lecture. lecture. So, George, so George, may I invite you please to take the screen, screen and over, over to you. To you. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, thank you, thank you very, very much, much, David. David. Um, it's, it's a great, 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 great pleasure. pleasure. It's a it's privilege. A privilege. To, 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 um, to, to have been invited to, you know, present in this lecture. Um, I, I wish to thank everyone who's been involved in um, this invitation and also everyone who's actually worked extremely hard to make it possible for this lecture to take place. I, I will start by saying thank you to, um, you know, the, 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 the original Australians. I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal and Bejigal people, people of the Eura nation, the traditional, traditional custodians, custodians of the land on which the campus of the UNSW, UNSW uh, in Kensington stands today. I pay my respects to the elders, past, past, 
present, present and future, future who hold, hold the memories, the memories traditions, traditions, culture, culture and, and hopes, hopes of Indigenous, of indigenous Australia. Australia. And I'd like, and to, I like to pay, pay you know, also, also homage, homage and respect, respect to, to every, every indigenous, indigenous Australian who is actually going to listen to me today. today. Um, um, we have traditions, we like, like to follow, follow them. them. And, and I thank you and all of you for joining me today. My talk is going to consider three big topics, crisis, Construction, construction and, and corruption. corruption. Um, so, so first, first I will talk, talk, I'll discuss, discuss with you crisis. crisis. Uh, this, uh, this is actually David's area, area, and, and um, <laughs> I'll, I'll just show just you show one, one or two slides about, about, about crisis, crisis, all right? All right. And, and we'll, we'll discuss, discuss whether, whether these crises crisis are on, on the increase or on the decrease, decrease and what and impact they have. Then we will then discuss, we'll discuss this, 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 um, this thing, a phenomenon called corruption. What is it? How does it arise? Who is involved in it? How, how, um, how much, how much of it is there, there and what, what can we, can we do, do about it? About it. And, and the next, the next one, one, we will see how the area that I belong to, construction, construction actually has, has quite a lot of corruption, corruption. And, and we will be exploring, exploring why this is so. so. We will be, we'll be, be looking, looking at what is what being done, done to address it. it. And I will spend a bit more time with you, sharing with you an initiative called the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative, or short form is cost. And, and um, um, it, it, trying to see how it actually helps, it helps, helps us to address this. this. Now, now we'll be uh, using, using the current, current uh, COVID, COVID situation, situation as an example of a crisis, crisis and also and as, as an example, example of how we can address this kind of crisis. crisis. Um, um, you know, um, um, and so, and so we, we will just, just go on to the next slide where we will start to look at this this big phenomenon called a crisis. So we go to the next slide, please. Yes, yes. So, so, so we, we hear about, about many, many um, kinds of crisis. crisis. Often you hear, you hear about, about economic, economic crisis, crisis, political, political crisis. crisis. Um, um, you hear about, about uh, you know, public, public health, health crisis. crisis. You, you hear you about, about um, you know, various, various kinds of crisis. crisis. There's, There's also a mention of mental, mental health, health crisis. crisis. But the crisis we're going to be focusing on today, or the examples of crisis we're going to be focusing on today, are disasters, natural or human made as well. Okay. okay, and, and every, every year, year there are many reports. reports. And so on this so slide, we, we, we see many, many reports, reports by first place national, national organizations. organizations. Then, then the second, second one on the top, top uh, left from the top left hand corner is by an um, American insurance organization called Aon. And then the next one is by the Red Cross, um, which um, David has experience with. And the final one is actually by a company also in the US as well. What I just want to also mention to you is that apart from the international reports, there are also national reports and perhaps also provincial and state reports. So I, I put the, the New South Wales report also in there. And um, this is the year 2018-19, where you had some, some quite major, major issues, including some you know, um, very scary fires and so on. All right. And then um, just to the right hand side of the New South Wales report, you will see uh, that report and we called a world at risk. And this report was published last year. And last in, in that report, you will also see um, you know, the coronavirus sign that we see today. That report just actually gave us a big warning that there are many pandemics coming up. And, and, and I, I thought they were very, very prophetic in the sense that we've actually encountered one major one and just now. Okay. So we we'll go on to the next slide and then we'll be looking at um, the, 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 you know, the occurrence of disasters. So this is, um, very complicated map, but what it's telling us is that in 2019, this map is from the uh, Red Cross, um, you know, Federation um, report. 2019, there were 308 um, events that could be called disasters, and, and so what I'm saying is that each of these disasters then, if you like, precipitates a crisis, all right. And increasingly, what we're also seeing is that a very large proportion of these disasters are actually um, the result of climate uh, situations. Okay, now these disasters affected 97.6 million people, and of these 97.6 million, we could say almost 100 million people, a huge, huge number of people, about 97 of them, you could say they are, um, the, the effect on them actually came from, from climate. So on the next slide, we will see um, if the economic uh, impact of, of these kinds of events. Okay, and so um, I'll just um, draw your attention to the, the, the graph at the bottom, where what we see are examples of uh, these kinds of disasters, uh, each of them precipitating a crisis. And, and those are from the Aon report. I mean, all these are from the Aon report. And then um, on the next um, 
uh, if you like, there's a table that um, it will be shown next uh, that actually gives us some figures and it's showing that um, in 2019, it cost the world 233 billion, you know, this crisis, these events as well, all right? And it, it indicates the number of people who are affected, uh, close to 2 million people being displaced in one year and so on and so forth. Okay. And you would also see that um, many of these were because of uh, changes in weather, changes in climate. Okay. So we have, we, we will say that we have seen the situation where we have crisis going on, causing damage, displacing people, um, people losing their livelihoods, and so on. So we go to the next slide, where we now look at the idea of construction. So what is it? I mean, it's a major, major con um, industry. It actually, if you like, builds for us the buildings we need, the, the bridges, the airports, the harbors, and things that we need to have economic development. And the value of construction around the world currently is about maybe $12 trillion, US dollars, all right? It's a huge thing. It's about, um, you know, say, 12% of global GDP. But what we have found is that much of this investment, especially the investment that the public makes, makes which in many countries is about, say, about... Um, 50 to 70 percent of the total is lost through um, through various kinds of corruption. So the ASC, the American Society of Civil Engineers, what they're saying is that every year about um, you know half a, half a trillion is lost because of um, you know various forms of corruption. And it, it, they're saying that some people think it's only in developing countries, but they're saying that it is not. It's actually everywhere. So there's a trend now to try and see, you know, what can be done about this situation. So the, the point that I'm making is that there is corruption in construction. Uh, it is, uh, I'll be establishing later on, on the, on the next slide, that it is um, causing a lot of, a lot of um, um, problems for us. And there, there is effort that is being made, or people are asking for effort to be made to enable construction to operate uh, without corruption and to, um, you know, to give better value for the money that is invested by governments and by taxpayers like you and me. So we go on to the next slide, please. Yeah, so so then what is this that we call corruption? Um, there are many definitions of it, but it's very simple. I like the UNDP definition, is the misuse of entrusted power for private gain, all right? And the, the, the definition at the bottom um, is the legal definition that is, um, you know, um, if like, um, in, uh, included in the act in New South Wales, um, 1988. I was trying to see whether there was a mo much more modern one, um, but this one kept coming up again in, in on the website, uh, sorry, in, in the internet. So I think it's still valid. It, it very carefully and I would say clearly indicates what corruption actually is. Now, corruption is um, something that really has a huge, huge impact. And on the right-hand side, the UNDP has actually outlined for us how you know what kind of impact it undermines everything that we tra we being uh, that is being done. For example, if you look at the you know the fact that between ten and thirty percent of investment is lost, then you can see uh, you know the foregone um, benefit as well. So on, on the next slide, we'll be looking at some examples of what we're talking about now. All right. So in corruption, we say there is corruption. Uh, so there is sorry in construction, we say there is corruption. Yes, and it happens throughout the construction process. Um, there's a report by, um, uh, 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 well, by um, uh, I'm, I'm trying, in, in, in Neil Stans, Stansbury, yes, and Neil Stansbury gives 47 examples of corruption in construction. These are some examples, some of the examples here at various stages. So at every single stage of construction, you will see certain elements of corruption taking place. So we go on to the next slide where we see a few more. Yes, a few more at every single stage, um, various examples of corruption. Unfortunately, my industry construction is indicated every year to be the most, if you like, the most corrupt. So there is this bright payers index, which the Transparency um, International does every, or used to do every year. The last one was in 2011. I haven't seen any, any more recent one, um, you know, which indicates that construction is at very much at the bottom in terms of the ranking as well, of all the sectors. We go on to the next slide, please, and um, we, we will see actually much more about this issue. So the reasons are on the on the left hand side. Um, it's be, because of the nature of construction work. You know, it it just um, is corruption prone. If you would like to you you would like to say, and and so what it actually then then does this corruption is that it actually reduces the value that we get. It it causes delays. It it um, 
it it if you like it, it it doesn't give us a level playing field it doesn't give us a competitive industry because of um you know if you like underhand practices that are taking place so we go on to the next slide please yes but the, the 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 hope that we have is that in fact something is being done and there have been agreements at the international level there are there is action at the national level and many um, organizations are indicated and in Australia, there is a commission that I think will be coming up very soon, um, you know, the, Com the Commonwealth Integrity Commission, to try to also address um, this idea of corruption. Okay, so governments are doing something about it, and um, in Australia is taking a very bold step to go, to go, to go forward in, in this way. So we're going to the next slide, please. And in construction also, there, are, there is action as well, uh, various levels of action and various types of action. Um, it, it takes it takes many forms, and I will just um, go on to one example. The example that I I wanted to share with you, and that example is the infrastructure transparency initiative, which we we will see on the next slide, please. Oh yeah, but before we go there, so just um, a sort of a series of reports indicating some of these examples. So when I say there is corruption in construction, so so who is actually involved in it? And there are reports so on the left hand side is a report by an international organization in the middle is a report by um, Ernst and young the the consultancy firm on the right hand side is a report by a law firm and at the bottom uh, is an example of um, uh, corruption taking place in a very developed country so snc Lavalin is the largest consultancy group in canada they were found you know to to have been involved in corruption outside canada anyway but you know they were actually put on the blacklist of the of the World Bank as well. And the, the next, um, if you like, clip is showing, or the next photo is showing the, the World Cup. And later on, maybe during the question and answer sessions, I'll say something about it. The World Cup in South Africa and how you know it's a cor corruption ridden. So we go on to the next slide, please, where I think um, we can discuss cost. Yes. So um, one, this is one example of how um, corruption is being addressed. It's the infrastructure transparency initiative. It involves government. It involves the industry and it involves civil society. The, the intention is that the, if like the principle is quite simple. What we are saying is that if we have transparency in construction, it reduces the likelihood that there will be corruption uh, because the public officer or anyone who wants to, if like, um, you know, influence someone who likes to, who wants to um, be involved in any corrupt act, takes a pause and thinks because in the end, this is going to be reported. So it has four elements, which I will very quickly share with you. The first one is that we're saying that it is it is a, a tripartite initiative, okay? The second one is that what we are saying is that we, we get the, the entities or the government organizations procuring um, construction items to disclose the information at various levels to a standard that uh, um, uh, we call the, you know, the OC4 IDS, is the Open Contracting for Infrastructure um, infrastructure development uh, standard, okay? And there are 40 data points that must be, you know, must be used. And the third element, which is actually quite unique, is that we don't take what the, the procuring entity publishes as, as the truth, but we have, um, uh, we have a, a third party that comes in, if you like, um, an impartial uh, group. Normally, it's actually a consultant, in, in, if you like, invited to do an audit and to actually um, check whether the data is correct and also indicate whether they have uh, any area of concern. And every year or, or a few times in a year, um, you know, these reports are published and this is a major event as well in various countries. The final one is social accountability. The question is, we have this information, but what is it being used for? So it's an attempt to, um, if like, provide um, the this, this skills and the ability to ordinary citizens so that they can actually you know, use this information to call people to, to action. Uh, to, sorry, to call people to account, yes, who haven't done the right thing as the assurance reports have indicated. We go on to the next slide, please. Yes, so this is um, how cost actually works. All right, so we apply the tools um, and then we, 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 we obtain those kinds of outcomes that are indicated in the middle. In the end, what we are trying to, to show and what we are trying to um, realize is that um, we will have better value for money and better services for people in, in various countries. So what, that's the vision of the initiative. 
quality infrastructure, stronger economies, better lives. Okay. And, and the initiative now has um, 19 members. And it's actually at the country level and also at the sub-national level as well. So there are 16 national level members and um, another three who are at the sub-national level. During the question and answer sessions, uh, session, I'll give you, give you some examples. Next slide, please. Yes, so, so then there is this link that is often found between, you know, um, Corruption and crisis. So we have spoken about crisis. Now the, the next thing that we, we would, um, you know, as, as David said, um, it's actually not the earthquake that actually kills people, but it's the buildings that collapse and kill people. But the, the, the next thing is that after the earthquake has happened, when we try to do something about it, because we're spending a lot of money very, very quickly, and because sometimes we say this is an emergency and therefore we should be less stringent in what we do, um, there is quite a lot of corruption that actually, actually happens. And on the left-hand side, I indicate a number of a number of things. And on the right-hand side, I I have um, another another um, well an, an, another extract from the report by the IFRC, which says that um, whereas we're talking about COVID, we, we must also remember that there are other disasters still taking place. And since COVID actually took um, you know have started. There have been more than 100 other disasters, and we should actually have a broad view about using um, what we know to address corruption, especially during crisis. And, and so we're going to go on to consider uh, the COVID situation very quickly. In the next slide, please. Yes, and so, so this is just um, a reiteration that um, during crisis, um, there is actually a, an increased risk of corruption. Next slide, please. Yes. So um, there, 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 there are two, if you like, there are two reports on the right hand on the on the right hand side. One of them is reminding us that um, you know this actually happens, and during crisis, um, corruption actually does happen, and they're suggesting um, some mitigation actions as well. And on the on the bottom is um, is a report by a consulting group that, um, remind uh, well, reminding the construction industry to be much more resilient in dealing with situations like what we have now. And so in cost, uh, what we have done has been to guide countries in what to do now um, in this situation where there is much more um, much more corruption, but there isn't much time. So how do you actually address this in, a, in, in, a, in, in, a, in an appropriate manner, but also very quickly so that you don't waste time and you don't actually you know, cause delays and things like that. So we've provided, we've provided guidance in doing this. And then we'll go on to the next slide and show some examples. Yeah, so um, these are some of the examples of what we are doing. So uh, the, the 19 member countries that I mentioned uh, includes Thailand. That's the example in the middle. All right. And then also includes Honduras. And so on the right hand side is the president of Honduras uh, saying that although we have um, a huge uh, crisis in COVID, we must make sure that when we are addressing the crisis, we do not forget transparency. Honduras is one of the leading members of the cost initiative and the president himself is very heavily involved. I mean, the national president is what I mean. He's very heavily involved in, in uh, transparency and especially in cost. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, we, we, we believe in cost that um, there is a, a possibility that during the, this crisis, there will be less space for one of the uh, three um, elements of our initiative and less space for civil society. And so we must make sure that, um, you know, we encourage countries to still uh, pursue transparency despite this situation or um, the, despite this tendency perhaps to um, want to push forward and as quickly as possible. And, and um, you know, in order to address uh, this current crisis that we have. Next slide, please. Okay, and so we have here just some examples of member countries, of course, um, uh, trying to address the crisis. And we go on to the next slide, please. Yes, so at, at the very bottom is a, is a link. If you go to the link, you will see what is being done in the cost member countries to try to, you know, address this situation, um, you, you know, well, without causing delay, if you like, yes. You know, make sure that you know, we have transparency while we are also um, taking action to um, address the crisis that we currently face. And on the next slide, please. 
Yes. So so then um, my time has already run run um, <laughs> run out. But I'll, I'll finish with two slides. So so this one is looking forward towards the future. Um, suggesting that we should, we must make sure that we actually learn from this situation. Um, you, you know, and try and see how um, by looking at what we have done now to address the crisis, we try and see how we can actually going forward into the future after the crisis, we can do things much better. And so when, when we say build, building it back better. And when we say we shouldn't waste the good crisis, we, ask, we should actually mean it, you know, by by taking um, by by taking a, if you like a, the the good from what is happening now, for what we are doing to address this situation and, and taking it forward. And and on, on the right hand side, I'm saying that um, this this particular crisis itself is showing that um, you know there are ways and means by which by using what we have now, we can actually as an industry in construction actually do better. And we go on to the next slide, please. And the next slide is where we then finish. And I will say that um, for me, I want to redefine the word corruption. Corruption, remember, we were saying is using um, entrusted an a public position entrusted to a person, or the person using a public position entrusted to him or her for for his or her personal gain. And I'm also saying that if we fail to draw attention to it, if we are aware of it and we fail to draw attention to it then we also could have been, you know, could be considered to be um, corrupt. And so we are saying, well, I'm saying that in the end, it comes to personal responsibility. But also in the end, I want to um, draw attention, well, uh, to, to remind my colleagues who are in the academic field that very, what is actually happening is that it's actually the practitioners, the professionals who are involved, uh, who are if like influenced in this way, and we must want to create a generation of upright and really ethical and very professional um, practitioners. Okay, and that I believe is, is is our job, and this is something that we should do. And I would also say that in the research that we do, in all the things that we do, let's just try and see how we can then bring about change in 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 the industry that we're working on. And um, I'll, 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 I will go to the next slide, and then we'll finish there. And the next slide is just. Um, uh, it's a little bit politically incorrect today, but it's it's a um, it's a Greek philosopher who set out to find, um, you know, an honest person. Try to look for a politician, couldn't find one. Try to look at an honest lawyer, couldn't find one. And in the end, you know, focused on a contractor, also couldn't find one. And now it's just looking for a person um, who is who he can be, he can consider to be uh, to be honest and to be not corrupt. And and this is this is something that um, I, I like to use when I give a lecture on ethics, and I think it, it's up to here. Uh, let, us, let us hope that in future, um, as educators, uh, as people in academia, as practitioners in industry, as government officials as well, uh, we are seen to be the man that Diogenes doesn't have to look far to find, that you know he actually sees, or the, the man or woman that Diogenes doesn't have far, far to find, but um, you know, that this, this, pers this person is actually very common in the industry that we have construction, an important industry, nevertheless, um, an industry that is actually, you know, very prone to um, practices that are not quite good. So I thank you very much for your attention. And, you know, I thank all of you um, for, for, for being with us at this lecture. And I, I, I hand back to David. George, thank you so much. What a powerful lecture you just gave. An awful lot of information. Okay, let me start again. George, thank you so much for that. That's so much information. That's so powerful. You have a wealth of experience and expertise, and having that uh, research ability means you have at your fingertips the evidence. And in a world where fake news is upon us, it's very important <laughs> to have the evidence. And the evidence does point to worsening crises, uh, to an increase in risk and vulnerability. And even the calls are unprecedented next year from the United Nations for those who impacted by COVID around the world. And so we are about to enter, it is safe to say, unprecedented times when it comes to levels of need because of sheer numbers on planet Earth and the impacts of COVID and other things, as you say, more than 100 disasters have taken place. And those are just the ones that are recorded, of course. So very powerful. I, I've, uh, I have the privilege of asking a few questions before, uh, <laughs> before others get to peek in, which I will read out. And quite a few are coming in. Thank you very much. Please keep your questions coming in. So George, I will do my level best to get to all of them uh, and talk to them. But I, I just wanted to pick up on something you just said, George. Uh, you said about personal responsibility. 
And there'll be people who have heard this, uh, your talk, and may be quite angry uh, that disasters are fueled and worsened by corruption, and may think helpless, but may want to do something. What would your advice be? What would you say to them about what they can do? Yes. So, so um, I'll, I'll just I'll just give an give an example of a researcher, and by by giving the example of a researcher, I will then give examples of various countries as well. So, as a, as researchers, um, there are certain topics that we don't cover. One of the topics that we don't cover is what countries are actually doing about. Um, if we say there is corruption in the construction industry, if we say um, it's actually the buildings that we build that actually fall down and kill people, then the question is, what are we doing about it? Um, even if we haven't been careful at that stage, once it has happened, what do we do about it? And I like to use the example of the Philippines. In the Philippines, the construction industry is very organized in the Contractors Association. They actually, um, if you like, will give their resources and their equipment and their various other things if you like, quite free, they put it at the disposal of the government. They actually go in and take action when there are those cyclones and which actually cause a lot of damage as well. So I'm talking about the construction industry then building the resilience within itself to actually take action. And so um, as a person, I, I, I can only talk about myself, as a person in my own particular field, um, well, what can I do in order to help the industries to be able to respond to crises when they do happen? And, and this is this is something that um, I, I, I would like to highlight uh, because we have some expertise that can actually be called upon very quickly um, during a crisis and let us try and see how, how we make that that possible and and so so the, the, so the, the question that you, you've asked is, is, is important and, and and very very much key and this is something that I want each of us to actually reflect upon so during a crisis any crisis the question is what can we do? about it yes and and for me as a researcher this is something that i keep asking myself how can we share knowledge um of how things are done in various countries yes um, thank you George. Maybe I can probe that a little bit further yes. uh, so uh, of course as you're, as you're knowing after earthquakes uh, after the uh, some years ago now in the late 90s there were two earthquakes in uh, turkey in quick succession builders were chased down the street as a result of buildings yes. that uh, fell down that shouldn't have that's happened in a number of earthquakes. People were charged a few months ago in Albania for murder for buildings yeah. that collapsed that shouldn't have collapsed. Is there, is there, I mean, if you're not if you're not part of the construction industry but a regular <laughs> regular person, um, is there anything you can do? Is it lobbying? Is it talking to MPs? Is it something else? Oh, okay, so so then um, I, I, I will be a, a bit because I'm I'm I have seen that you know the cost initiative actually does work. So I'll be I'll be a little bit partial by saying that I think countries should go for transparency, and and in many countries the, this this um, move towards transparency has come from civil action, it has come from a push by by civilians, and so I'll just give an example of um, the the chief executive of the procuring agency in in my country, all right, um, was was sacked in the end because of an investigation. By civil, by, by, by civil organizations into an action that he was he was taking or a series of actions that he was taking that were you know that in the event end meant that he was very corrupt. So so government can't actually reach everywhere. I think civil society and ordinary sometimes ordinary people sometimes maybe putting their lives at risk um, can can actually also help. Yes, in this case. And so if, if the government hasn't taken action. Um, they, they, what is actually happening in many many places is that they do not give up; they they still keep you know keep at it. Yes. And sorry, George, that, that would that be Ghana? Your me, me, me. <laughs> yes. Just to no. clarify, you've lived in so I, many. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to put my country, <laughs> okay. but, but this is this, this, is, is, this is the audience. Is, so I think only only um, about ten days ago, the president actually wrote a report. Uh, sorry, um, a letter, released a letter to say that you know the the CEO has been sacked. Yes. Mm. And, and so, um, it, it, where you have situations where the top people are not spared from swift action, uh, you actually ha have people taking pause to actually think about what they're doing. But for me, transparency is key. And the fact that we now have 19 uh, members of this initiative, 19 uh, and growing, I, I like to say, is, is quite quite uh, important. Let, let me also take this opportunity um, uh, we have we have a bit more time, but let me take this opportunity to remind. Um, there was something on the, one of the slides that I didn't highlight. 
to remind um, you know, people around the world that the United Nations and in fact all governments have actually signed on to um, certain, certain um, compacts, conventions, agreements, and if you like, um, ag agree to make laws. All right, and and one of them has been an agreement by all countries to to devote um, or to de to denote one particular day on the 9th of December as World Anti-Corruption Day. So on the 9th of December, many many events will be taking place, and there will be many events also taking place um, after David's conference um, at the um, University of New South Wales and around the world. And I was going to say that um, we in COST are going to do a big event, and that and that at that event. We are going to um, release and launch um, an index that we're producing. This index is going to assess the extent to which countries um, are transparent. And we believe that this is a major, major game changer. And so if you have time, I will suggest, you know, you listen, I'll, I'll send the link later on um, to, to David and, and, and so that, um, you know, people can actually um, know that this is happening uh, because the president of Guatemala will be speaking at this, at this conference as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, cost has, yes, <laughs> that's right. I'm sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, and and then the, the, there's another um, another conference also taking place on the same day. Actually, that one being done by FIDIC. FIDIC is the international uh, group of consultants as well. Also looking at this same issue on the 9th of, uh, of December. Now, I was going to say that last year, 9th of December, I was in Mozambique to uh, help to launch the membership of Mozambique of the Cost Initiative, and on this on that same day, Timor Leste also joined Cost. And so um, what I'm saying is that attention and focus is being put on these bad practices and, and we should take advantage of, um, if you like, of this move by people and, and if you like everyone to try and address um, this situation that we find ourselves in, of corruption, especially in construction. Yes. Thank you, George. I wanted to ask you a question, just one more from me, and then I'm going to turn to the yes. audience, those who are patiently yes. waiting. You, you mentioned COVID-19, which obviously has affected all of us. And in March this year, the head of bribery at the OECD said that COVID was going to be, quote, a paradise for corruption. Uh, and <laughs> yes. I'm wondering what your reflections are on that. And if that has been the case, what might have been done differently? Yes. So, so actually, uh, okay, so we at COST are paying very particular attention to this. Um, because during during a crisis, something that I haven't mentioned, during a crisis, what actually happens is that, for example, like COVID, you know, people are uh, sheltering, people are, you know, shielding, um, they, they are social distancing, which means that the public uh, agencies are not as effective, and uh, I mean, the capacity is reduced considerably, and that, that is why, therefore, it is possible, monitoring is reduced, that is why, therefore, it's possible for, you know, illegal acts to, to take place. And, and um, what we are very carefully looking at is how this affects, how this takes place in construction. We haven't found big, big issues, um, but um, the example of countries which have said that all projects that they're doing, although they have to expedite them, they will put them still under the cost, um, uh, you know, proceed, set of procedures, um, I think is, is very useful. Um, so the OECD examples, um, so I was looking at uh, examples of corruption during COVID. And I found uh, on the website of Transparency Inter International, there is a, a very, there's an interesting blog, which anyone who has time should look at it. Um, it actually gives lots of examples during the Ebola crisis, lots of money that was pledged was lost. It actually eventually didn't find itself, itself to, you know, being put to the right use. And during many, many crises, there are examples of corruption, of money not having been applied in a proper way. And that's why I think the OECD um, you know, a chief made that statement. Um, so uh, there have been lots of warnings, and that's why I also showed the U4 um, report, looking at previous experiences, and this is also something that guides us, that looking at previous experiences, we have to be much more careful now uh, during the COVID situation so that we can actually address, um, we, okay, we should anticipate the fact that there will be more, more corruption and try and see how we can address the situation, yes. Thank you. Maybe I can follow on the generic uh, crisis point. Yes. Uh, pick up two or three questions from the audience. There's a question here. In terms of balance, are yes. crises more likely to result in corruption or positive impacts? Ah, <laughs> okay. So, so, so these are these are two things that um, I I I. I, I I think towards the towards the end of my uh, my talk, I was saying that we should try and see what we can we can take 
from how we have addressed COVID and how we have addressed crisis towards doing things better. Because, um, you know, during crisis, because we're having to spend big amounts of money using weakened systems because of the crisis, um, the tendency towards corruption actually happens. Now, also during crisis, because we have done things slightly differently, there are some positives as well. And so let us not throw out the baby with the bathwater, but let us try and see what positive things actually does hap do happen when we try to address um, uh, or, or when we try to address crisis and try and take them forward. So one of the positive, for example, is some of the buildings that have been built that, are, that were not good quality might actually collapse, but let us try and put in their place better, better buildings. That's not an excuse for doing things wrong so that in future we can do them better, but you know, uh, just because the, the, the items have actually collapsed, let us try and build them back better. And, and I, think, I think that is the positive. Yes. Thank you. There's some questions coming thick and fast and some really great questions yes. coming. So I'm going to fire some at you. Let's fire some at you if I may, George. Yes. Uh, here's one. Uh, are there some key lessons from countries such as Singapore, where you've lived for many years, of course, who have been mm -hmm. able to reduce or, you know, and or minimize corruption? Yes. I suppose that's, OK, yeah. so, so <laughs> should I go on? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Go yes. ahead. Okay, so 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 before I go on to that one, I, I want to also say something so that uh, while I have the opportunity. And so this is uh, Neil Stansbury, and he says something that I would also very firmly believe. He says it is possible to eradicate co corruption from construction. And he says it is the responsibility of governments, of industry, of, um, of practitioners, and everyone in, in the end. And this is why these days when I see reports, I also look at, I find it very refreshing that the reports don't, don't just address their recommendations to government. They also address their recommendations also to everyone, in saying that, you know, ordinary people also have a role to play. Yes. So the question I've been asked is about Singapore. In Singapore, it's actually state action, which is very, very strong. And, and there are various principles. One of the principles is that um, they have a group, of, sorry, an agency called the Corrupt Practices Investigations Bureau. All right. So the law is clear that the CPIB is very strong. And in, in, you know, the, the, in the area of corruption, the, the fact that you cannot get away from doing the wrong thing is often a reason why people pause and, and be uh, careful in what they do. And so, for example, in Singapore, um, if you invite a civil servant to, to lunch, he will very likely not accept, not accept it. Okay, not because he's forbidden, not because he wants to be unfriendly, but because he wants to be not for, he wants it not to be seen that he's being influenced in this way. So the the the, the clarity of the law, the the fact that if you do it, you will be caught because there is a very strong monitoring system. There's a strong agency, and the fact that if you are caught, you will you will not be spared, no matter how senior you are. And, and finally, the fact that the punishments are, are if you like um. Uh, 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 where well, they can be as severe as, as as necessary, okay, actually puts people off. So so those four principles are, are, are quite useful. But always this idea of transparency, I, I like to go back to and say it's key. Yes. That's Thank right. you, George. Maybe I can tag, uh, tag on a question uh, from somebody else. Yes. Uh, do we this? The answer to this might be sort of straight. No, it depends. You don't know if you don't. Do we have any example of corruption in Australia in relation to COVID? Ah, that's a so, so that one, um, I, I think I think maybe someone in Australia can answer this question. As, as it, good. I, I just wanted to not let anybody think I wasn't going to ask that. Okay, then maybe I can jump to this. This is a really interesting yes. question I, I want to put to you um, from from our audience, and uh, it's a bit long, but it's it's very interesting. Are steps being taken to address corruption in construction uh, by adopting global ethics standards as suggested by the IESC? Research suggests that ethical relativism means the approach won't succeed. Well, what are your thoughts on this, George? Yes, so, 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 so that, that's why I go, I go back to the point made by, um, by, by Neil. Um, but I think I think the point the point that is being made here is because contexts differ, it it may be appropriate to look at country uh, country level initiatives. 
Okay, and so for example, in cost, we don't apply the same uh, the same. Uh, okay, we don't say we have the same size that should fit everyone. Okay, but we allow countries to modify the, the the approach so long as they have those four elements that I've highlighted. Okay, so I, th I think the point that is being made is that culture is different. Ethics, in the, what what is ethical is also different from country to country. Um, we accept that, but we're also saying that we must nevertheless be um, willing to you know take action. There are also at the same time very very um, if you like um, generic and quite similar approaches to ethics around the world and and. Um, we, we, we would also say the, the global, uh, if you like, principles are necessary, but we have to accept that, you know, country level practices are perhaps those that are likely to work best. Yeah. So, so, so the two go hand in hand. Um, I, I wouldn't say because it's a global initiative or a global um, uh, convention or a global law, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't apply at the country level. If the country should interpret it in their own way and try and try and see how it actually will work in their own context. Mm. Thank you. And, and a, a, a sort of question, of course, it's yes. terribly hard to measure corruption. Um, uh, the, what, one of the best we have is Transparency International's Corruption's Perceptions Index, but then quite mm. a lot of people don't like that and criticize it for good reason. Obviously, it's very difficult to conduct research. And so a question from someone in the audience, which methods yes. do you use, or cost perhaps, to conduct research about corruption in a country, local stakeholders certainly won't well don't welcome it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so so um, well, various countries have come up with uh, the whistleblower law, and um, okay, so you just just saying some taking the opportunity to say another thing about cost first before I try and answer the question. Uh, the fact the the the, um, the initiative encourages countries. To have um, what, what is called um, a, 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 a mandate, you know, a requirement in the country that every public sector, um, like a procurement, must be um, transparent. Must actually ap um, apply the, the the transparency principles as well. Okay, so it's not you do it if you like, but you actually do it because the law says we must. Now, when, once it says that, then it means the industry must also be familiar with how this is done. And then it, it requires the industry to, if you like, gear up and have training to actually do this as well. Yes. And so um, this actually does happen. Now, the question that was asked is how do we measure transparency? Um, nations, um, major players don't, don't welcome it and so on. Um, there are various conventions that are being, being practiced. But we believe that the index that we have, we have produced, which we launched on the 9th, is it's very useful. Uh, this index is not about corruption, it's about transparency. But I think, um, you know, if you can actually measure the extent to which a country is transparent, all right, I think it would be very useful in, you know, in, in, in this fight to address corruption and in, and in this fight to actually measure the extent of corruption in a country. Thank you. I would also add court cases because, uh, and, you know, probably most countries put it like that, uh, court proceedings are publicly available and, and are seeable and go into great detail for obvious reasons. Um, two or three questions relating to uh, a point you mentioned, George, about the responsibility of teachers and others uh, yes. talking about instilling ethical um, thoughts, I suppose, or approaches. And one question, how might we instill principles of integrity and ethical grounding in our students? Are there methods you have used, perhaps? <laughs> yes. So, so, so this is... Um... This is a, this is a very interesting question. So so um, it may be a long answer, but um, let, let, let me go on. So so uh, there's a university in China. It's called Tsinghua Tsinghua University. Now Tsinghua University is one of the top universities in China. They introduced um, a, a master's program in construction project management, and one of the modules that I suggested that they must have is a module on ethics and professionalism. And I developed the module and I taught it for them. And uh, some of the, um, if you like, some of the material for the talk that I've just given, is actually from that module. I, I think we, um, as uh, because corruption is very rife in construction, I think we should have such such modules, if you like, as part of the courses that we deliver. We should have, um, you know, ethics actually, you know, drummed into people. Uh, the Association of Civil Engineers in the U.S. Um, has a code for engineers, a very useful code. It wants every engineer to actually sign up to it and, and 
it is on their website and it, they actually get every member and it, not, not just their own members, but everyone who is a practitioner in construction to actually sign up to it. I think you know, what, they, what they're trying to, uh, to do is to you know, let people realize their personal responsibility, the, the point that I keep making. And, and also in, in, the, in the end, what, I make, um, what I'm, I'll say it again, that we as educators have this responsibility to make sure that we produce the professionals who will um, actually come into the industry and make the change um, you know, towards moving the industry away from the corrupt practices because they themselves wouldn't do it. Yes. And Georgia, a related question to that, which is, yes. is very interesting. You mentioned that the responsibility of academics is to produce ethically minded professionals. And, and this yes. bit, what ethical values do you see as underdeveloped or what is the most important? Ah, <laughs> yes, that, that's um, it's, it's an interesting question. And so this is this is one of the things that I I, I try to do. For, for, well, for example, when it comes to sustainability, what I'm saying, we can I'm saying that we can say quite a lot about sustainable construction, but unless we have, you know, we have um, practitioners who who um, you know are re recognizing that it is they in the end, it is actually them, you know. Um, so, so one one very simple ethical ethical value I would I would say is the the question um, the question that I like my students and anyone uh, including the one who has asked the question to consider is this now if people who know that profession were to look at what I am doing would they say that what I have done is right if they will have any question then I must be very careful. And that I do not do it. Yes, so 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 that is the very basic ethical principle. It, it will, will the profession um, endorse what you are doing? Uh, when I say the profession, I mean in that you you know you you are, if someone who actually does know the right thing uh, in the circumstances where to see what you have done, would it be correct? Would it be right? Would he or she endorse it? Yeah, and and this is um, I I believe a principle that we must must follow. Yeah. So the question is, is it right? And so, so what I'm saying is, the, is it right? It's not something that you hedge, but it's something that you are quite willing uh, to be, if you like, um, to be transparent about. Yeah. Great question here uh, about leadership, um, yeah. and it starts by saying, I cannot resist asking your thoughts <laughs> on the role of leadership at industry and organizational level. In, eradicate, in eradicating corruption in construction? Is yes. the leadership complicit? <laughs> well, well, leadership is complicit, but leadership is also instrumental as well. And, mm -hmm. and um, well, well, this is why, uh, okay, so in the module that I referred to, so it was leadership, ethics, and professionalism, uh, because there was no space to teach leadership separately. So we put the three together, and I believe they go together extremely well. And, and um, so that's why I showed also the example of the president of Honduras. And that's why I'm also saying that on the 9th of December, the president of Guatemala will be speaking. And so the leader, if the leader is upright, if the leader is seen to be not one actually in it for himself or herself, and I believe you know others would, would if you like, do likewise, yes. I, I've got a question I, I can't resist asking, taking a cue from our last question. And I'm slightly hesitant yes. to ask you, but um, sometimes in the humanitarian space, uh, some people might think, or, or perhaps even argue or do, uh, the idea that a, a bit of corruption is okay because there's a larger uh, imperative. Do you ever think that some corruption is okay? <laughs> yes. Um, the, 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 that is one of the things that I cover when I teach uh, this topic. And that many people say it's actually, well, the way of, the way to do business in some of the, some of the developing countries, number one, and secondly, also it makes things go faster, and thirdly, there are poor people and they benefit from you know a bit of a bit of gift, a bit of a bit of um, well, a, a slightly corrupt practice here and there, and then they say that we should look at petty corruption uh, instead of grand corruption. Sorry, sorry, we should ignore petty corruption, yes, and focus on grand corruption. So we should ignore little, little, you know, handouts and little um, kickbacks and actually focus on the big things. Um, that, 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 that argument has some merit, but um, I would say if, if we actually want to go for it, then it's something that we should also try and, try and prevent as well. And, and this is why, so going back to Singapore, 
or, or there is um, an interesting situation where they pay civil servants well enough that they are not tempted to be to be corrupt. Yes, and and they also pay ministers well enough that they are not tempted to be corrupt. And so, um, uh, corruption being seen to be a, a good thing uh, in some set, in certain contexts, um, I would say. I, I wouldn't be too hard, but I would say let us try and see whether we can actually avoid situations where, in fact, corruption is seen to be good. Yeah. Is it Thank possible? Thank you for that. I, I, yes. I, I take back any hesitance I had asking you that. Tomorrow's Europe 2 conference, the second session is titled, This is not a disaster, this is a crime scene. And that quote is from a very senior official in India who says these things are not disasters, they're crime scenes, because actually those buildings often fell down for a reason. Uh, so is corruption okay leading to disaster? Uh, no, is the evidence. So thank you for uh, thank you for clarifying that. But I, yes. I wanted to ask you. Um, we we had time for a, a couple more questions, and there's a question here. I'm going to ask, and I'm going to ask you one final one of my own because I because I okay. have the power to do that. <laughs> uh, the question here is: Should we introduce crisis construction regulators like the ICAC? I don't know what the ICAC is, but maybe maybe your name, George. A crisis construction regulator. Oh well, I, I suppose we could ignore ICAC. Uh, no, okay, so so there is there is in fact um there is there is a an annual conference is a an international um a conference on anti corruption. It, it happens every year. So I'm not sure whether this is the one that um the 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 the, the questioner is asking. But but there are in fact there are if like global and I think they, there was a previous question that was asked. There are some global conventions. Uh, that are in place. I mean, the, the RICS has um, an international, I mean, they actually brought together a group of professional organizations to sign an international, uh, I feel like, set of principles on ethics in in in, in practice in construction. Yeah. Oh, so so you. these international level actions are taking place. But the point that also we, we spoke about when we were answering a question earlier on is that um, international conventions are useful and good. Uh, in many cases, we must also see what will work in individual countries as well. And so um, country, industry, a professional institution and so on must, ah, okay, okay. So so there's the Independent Commission Against Corruption. Yeah. Um, the, okay, so, so I'll go back to the point that um, professional institutions in various countries must also be trying to do something about what is actually happening in their country, taking, if you like, the international level um, principles and, and guidance. And, and taking action on the on the ground. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to ask you one final question before we wrap up. Is um, how do you stay optimistic? <laughs> okay, I, I'm optimistic because I think um, the, the the point that I made earlier on about creating a generation of of ethical and and good professionals, I think it is coming. But but it will not come by itself. It is something that you and I and, and you know, people here um, in the audience um, are going to have to work very hard to try to, um, if you like, bring about. Yeah. Mm. And it's it's not just the construction people, presumably, George. It's it's all of us. We're in it together, as it were. Or? Exactly. So, so again, I go back to the point that that I made. So now, nowadays, so many of the United Nations um, agencies, when they write reports, they don't finish by just Making a making a call to government, making a call to uh, international, if you like, um, development partners. But they also make a call to industry. They make a call to ordinary people like you and I, um, which in this case we are. Yes, you know, as to what we can do, because I think we have a lot of, even as individuals, we have some part to play in bringing about change. Wonderful. Yes. Um, George, we're at the end of our time. I would like to thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor George Afori, for your brilliant and informed insights uh, on this subject, none of which is simple or easy. Um, yeah. we'll be, you've launched our conference tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We have the Head of Transparency International speaking on the subject and people from a number of leading universities to really follow, follow up <laughs> from what you've been saying. But thank you, yes. George, very much. I wish we were together and we'd all go and talk to people in the audience now for the next two hours. But this is our reality for yeah. this year. And thank you so much, George. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank yeah. you, and uh, have a good day and a good night from Sydney. And thank you all very much for uh, listening to this. The broadcast will be uh, freely available uh, very soon on the UNSW website and on YouTube. So thank you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.